first marathon as a stock tape. And, but um, as a slight diversion and a bit of a break from um, um, stock taking, funnily enough, um, we would share with you um, a little bit about the history of the archive service. So this is a talk that Robert and I gave um, to, um, on, well, actually it's our open day uh, on the 12th of November. So uh, we had about 25 people come along to that. So that, that was really good. And um, so we thought we should just share that with you. Now, I would say first and foremost that, you know, you, we could do a, a whole day's kind of symposium on the history of the archive service um, if we wanted to. The history of the service is actually very, very rich indeed. And but it's also quite complicated. Um, and I sort of, when I joined the archives in, I think, 1993, um, you know, the kind of myth is that it started, life started in 1962. Uh, and there was very little kind of acknowledgement of what the service, you know, what had gone on before uh, and that, you know, record keeping is something that never happened in Cumbria before 1962. Of course, that's complete nonsense. Um, and um, also as part of the um, research is um, into into our story, our shared history, if you like, um, you know, has revealed we've actually um, both have unearthed interesting facts about the service and, in, and evidence about the service that we had assumed didn't actually survive. So um, it's um, so it's been a really uh, great opportunity, and I'd Thank really you. like to you know to sort of build on this um, in the future. Um, so if, if there's any bits of this that just sound blindingly obvious and um, um, uh, and um, stuff you already know, apologies. As I say, this is basically what we shared with. Um, an audience of people who would be like, who would inevitably be less familiar with the story, but um, so just bear with us on on those kind of episodes, um, which actually starts this talk um, because I started the talk by um, explaining that the service uh, was established at the end of 1960. I know we've made 1962 our kind of official um, kind of memorial date, if you like, but or anniversary date. Um, it's and it's the story of uh, the counties of Cumberland and Westmoreland and the city of Carlisle, which was a kind of a county borough, um, coming together to establish a joint archives committee. Um, so um, October 1962 is the date we like to um, use as our kind of official start of our history. It's not quite the right date, but I think since we celebrated the 30th, the 40th and 50th anniversaries on that basis, it, um, I think it was a little bit too late to uh, kind of change that. Um, um, but it's the date that both the Carlisle and the Westmoreland uh, record offices um, opened, um, um, which is why we've we've gone with that date. Um, but much of today's talk is really about uh, the prehistory of the service because um, you know there is a story of um, record keeping that goes back a long way before that. Um, and it's quite, an, it's a really interesting story to share. Uh, and it does give the lie to the idea that life starts. Um, so central to our, our story, uh, we've hung this really on two kind of figures um, who um, played a, a really fundamental, important role in um, the establishment of where we are today, if you like, uh, Tom Gray. Um, who was um, long associated with Tully House um, when it was also a library as well as a museum and was an avid antiquarian. And Madeleine Elsass, who, you know, when I joined the service was, was kind of well known as our first Cumberland archivist and there are folk stories of her cycling around, bicycling around parishes in Cumberland, uh, carrying out uh, surveys of parish records in situ of the church. Of course, that doesn't begin to do justice to uh, her role and actually how she got to Cumberland as well, which is going to be uh, the subject of what uh, Robert is going to be um, looking into a little bit later. But the Tom, 50 years association with Tully House, um, born in 1883 um, to Thomas and Annie Gray in Carlisle, um, but he was already employed at Tully House at the age of 14. Um, and uh, by the age of 19 was chief assistant librarian. 
Um, so uh, remarkable in itself. And his career um, really does establish, um, does, is very much about establishing some of the uh, foundations of um, archive management in, in, Cumbria, in Cumberland and Carlisle in particular um, up until uh, 1949. To begin with, so um, he was promoted um, uh, and then served in the Royal Army Medical Corps during the First World War. Um, but his, we can see evidence of his kind of commitment to local history and archive keeping with his election to the Cumberland and Westmoreland Antiquarian and Archaeological Society as and as honorary librarian, um, and then being appointed to director of Tully House and you could imagine a kind of Tully House almost being a the very an early example of a one-stop shop in that it was the museum it was the library and it was also um, the the main public face of archives access to archives um, up until pretty much um, the Second World War he retires in 1949 but that's certainly not the end of his career because Almost immediately after that, he um, becomes a part-time consultant archivist, although I very much doubt he was part-time. He was quite an obsessive by all accounts. Um, uh, for Cumberland, um, and um, he's in 1960, at the age of 77, he's appointed as the first county archivist of the Joint Archives Committee, and he dies at his desk planning records moves to uh, the Alma Blockers, which was our first archive centre in Carlisle, at the age of um, 78. Um, so a very remarkable career. Um, but it is worth thinking that even in 1960, just um, how patchy the care and, our, um, and access to archives was. Um, I mean, Bruce Jones makes the point that uh, Mr Gray, as he was known, um, had struggled against discouraging odds to give life to the record office in Cumberland and at the time of his death was was within sight of his goal. But he also um, came to the profession, I think late in life. He was one of these people that he didn't actually write that many articles for the CMW, but he was really fastidious about encouraging other people in um, writing um, for the CMW and um, and, the, and helping them in their research. So he was a source of inspiration in that regard as well. Um, but he was, you know, had a very quick and active mind by all accounts. His knowledge of history of the county and his skill in teaching and stimulating others to take an interest in history and historical records is what I think were his kind of winning killer apps, if you like. Um, and they were kind of qualities that would have outweighed any kind of lack of formal training um, and method. Um, um, but he was also very committed to seeing colleagues train because one of the things he did uh, towards the end of his career was to encourage uh, support two of his library assistants at Tully House to uh, undertake formal training in archives management um, as well. And, you know, it bore fruit. Tully House was um, started collecting historical records in 1910, um, um, was recognised by the Public Record Office and the Master of the Rolls um, as a place of deposit um, as early as 1926. Um, but we have a complication um, because Cumberland also has um, um, a records keeping function as well. It's officially kind of recognised from 1881 in terms of creating a storeroom in the courts to, to keep the records. But as with all county record office offices, Cumberland um, has a has a formal kind of records management function, if you like, um, in store in managing and uh, being a place of deposit for records, the, its own official records, right going right back to the quarter sessions, which in Cumberland take you back to 1666. Um, so there is this kind of dual picture of um, two services um, effectively um, operating alongside each other, except that Cumberland, there was no member of staff um, assigned formally to look at to the archives function until about 1942, which is when Madeleine Alsace comes into the picture. Um, but even with her efforts, 
um, and she was also avidly interested in collecting records as well. Um, you have a story of um, the, the strong room in the courts filling up. You have basements around Carlisle in places like Portland Square filling up. Um, so it's quite um, so urgent action was required um, uh, by 1960 to make a decision on the situation um, that existed. And that's just a story in Cumberland. We also have um, in Westmoreland um, quite a long history as well, which we'll go into a little bit more further down. But in summary, um, there was certainly no archives, paid archive service in Westmoreland until 1962, except that Kendall Library was an avid, like a lot of um, public libraries, was very active in collecting historical records. Um, you have uh, an archives committee established around 1890, which uh, we found some evidence of. And when Com County Hall was built, there was a tacit recognition of that historic function to um, manage the county's records, the clerk's records, county secretaries and the quarter session records. So Strong Room 1 was built as a minimum room, as the, one of the terminology we use, um, back in 1939. Um, so um, that's um, so that's the kind of the picture that we we had kind of got to. So you know, the next slide, please. Um, but one of the um, I think one of the kind of um, drivers of of change in a way um, was um, the Second World War. Um, so we have this kind of escalating situation in terms of pressures on records storage, but then we have um, the outbreak of war. Um, one of the critical issue, um, inspirations, I think, for um, the next chapter is the, um, the fact of the factor of air raids on uh, Cumbria. Um, Barrow was bombed in nine, April and May 1941, and this became an, ins um, an inspiration for um, needing to evacuate records and recognise the importance of finding safe alternative homes for them. Um, it's also one of the things that we were, we've were we long been aware um, that records were evacuated uh, from Carlisle in particular uh, during the Second World War, but we've never been able to unearth any evidence of it um, uh, until we started doing the research um, on the, um, for this talk. So um, we did unearth, um, unearth some correspondence in the clerk's department records of Cumberland and I had a look through those and um, they gave us the evidence, the correspondence between the uh, clerk of Cumberland County Council with um, local landowners. Um, in particular, there's um, the Yellow Earl, uh, Hugh Lowther at Lowther Castle, um, Netherby Hall um, and um, the Garlands were among the places that the records went to. So we have um, um, quite an interesting story there in terms of um, actually what happened to the records. They were kept um, away from Carlisle until between June 45 and July um, 46. So if we can have the next slide, please. So this is an um, acceptance of records at Lowther Castle. Um, so this is um, the Earl of Lonsdale replying to um, the, uh, the clerk. So thank you for your letter of the 29th instant and you are only too welcome to store your records at Lowther Castle. I hear some have already been um, stored, but anyhow, you're welcome to make whatever use uh, you like of the place. Um, it is convenient to you and the county, yours truly, Lonsdale. Well, um, that's an interesting offer that uh, Lowther Castle was being used for tank training by the army as well. So, I'm not, so I think there were some logistical difficulties in um, making use of Lowther, but um, they clearly did, because if we look at the next slide, um, this is actually about the return of the records um, to um, uh, the courts. Um, and this is actually a handwritten note by Madeleine Elsass, um, itemising the uh, records to be returned. So there's 11 boxes of Treasurer's Department, the box of the Medical Officer of Health, and there are boxes from the Architect's Department. 
And rather interestingly, particularly to our conservation colleagues, um, there is reference to a number of pictures taken out of the grand jury room um, that will be brought back at a separate time, hopefully um, by um, correspond by um, suitable methods. Um, as we just had that in terms of evacuating the grand jury room to um, store our pictures at um, to store the pictures um, and display them at. Um, Petrol bank. So, um, so that's kind of so that's kind of, was an interesting episode in 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 the kind of wartime history of uh, Cumberland in particular. Um, after the war, um, we have this kind of this issue of really of um, these two services running parallel at Carlisle. Um, and there being kind of limited understanding of what um, each other was doing, um, as both Tully House and uh, Cumberland had that ambition to become the prime principal kind of records keeping centre um, in Carlisle. Um, eventually, Cumberland did win out. They had an appointed archivist. Um, and when Tom Gray retired in 1949, he uh, went on to um, become consultant archivist for for Cumberland. Um, so um, it's an interesting it's, it's an interesting kind of period of, but Tully House of course continues to be um, um, it, its its role as uh, as a, a as an archive author as well. Um, the next I suppose the next major kind of uh, step comes, which takes us up to the kind of beginning of Cumbria Archive Service is really 1956, um, which is um, the potential risk to the papers of the Earl of Lonsdale in 1956. He, he was offering them for, um, an he wanted to find an alternative home for them because uh, Lowther Castle was no longer a viable place. It, it had been, it was being stripped of its roof and all the rest of it. Um, but he was a very patient man because it took five years to come up to a um, solution for this. But it, was, it did become the major um, um, impetus, really, for the creation of the modern service. So Bruce Jones kind of summed it up in an article he wrote in 1965. Um, it says all three authorities would have been faced with a heavy financial expenditure in finding and equipping proper accommodation for the storage of the Lonsdale archives and an appointing staff to sort and catalogue them. And neither of the two counties nor the city was in a position to carry the burden alone. The only possible chance of keeping the records in the area seemed to lie in the joint enterprise of two or three of the authorities acting together. And that was a real concern because uh, the Howard family papers of Nowath uh, Castle near, near Carlisle um, were at, uh, what is now Durham University Special Collections Department, um, because there wasn't a suitable home for them uh, in in Cumberland. Um, so um, the committee was eventually established to find suitable accommodation, and Tom Gray in 1960 um, was appointed as the first county archivist of the Joint Archives Committee um, to. Uh, and played this, the, the kind of the key role um, in securing these papers uh, by arranging the lease of Carlisle's first record office. Um, so the building, the Alma block, which some of us all remember, um, uh, was chosen for that. It was large enough. It was suitable for uh, conversion to archive storage. Um, and um, and was in the process of being converted when Tom Gray suddenly um, declined. Now, I think um, there was a slight interregnum um, uh, before uh, Bruce Jones joined the service, um, but um, he, he came in at the end of 19, late 1962 and um, took the service forward. So we've got some illustrations. That's Bruce Jones. Um, um, on the left there, uh, and this is the reading room, which is not that different to what I remember when I joined the service um, in uh, 1993. Um, 
And then we've got um, the, the Alma block was also home to the first conservation um, lab. Um, although I don't think it was called that. I think it was just called the bindery at the time. It was much, much, uh, very, very different to our current facilities. And that's Bob Mumberson, who I remember, um, who just retired shortly before I um, before I came, but was a regular visitor. Um, um, in, in the bindery there. Um, can we have the next slide, please? So, um, 1962 sees the creation of um, the, um, at the same time, of a Westmoreland record office. Um, and um, Sheila McPherson appointed as the first archivist. She had to work on her own, quite literally, for the first three years of. Um, Kendall. Um, the, the picture in the middle is a very, one very familiar to the staff at Kendall because we display it um, prominently. I think it's still in the strong room one, um, but that's the strong room at the time around 1960 as it was being fitted out. Um, the archive is the one archive centre that is still in the same location, uh, although it's undergone uh, many changes in format since then. Um, but um, and it's, it's it's a good representation and probably one of the last remaining representations of um, of an archive of a county archive service um, in the basement of County Hall because that's pretty much how most of them would have started life. They had an, an administrative role uh, in their origins rather than antiquarian collection, if you like. Um, so they're a close association with the rest of the county. Um, County Council um, was, you know, deemed really significant. Um, it's also just worth bearing in mind just some context really to how the service started. It is um, Cum Cum Cumbria is not an entirely new creation. It wasn't in 1974. Um, it's worth remembering that the there's a long history of collaboration between the counties and other local authorities. Um, a key one, a very long standing one, was the Cumberland and Westman Constabulary, which was established, I think, in around 1856. So it was about 100 years old um, in 1960. The County Lunatic Asylum at the Garlands served both Cumberland and Westmoreland. Um, Diocese of Carlisle's boundaries have always encompassed both counties to a greater or lesser extent. Um, a major landowner, such as the Lowthers, Musgraves, and the Penningtons, and the Fleming, owned uh, land in both counties as well. And there's, there are very long standing historical and cultural bonds um, between the two counties that um, were very strong. So, in a sense, you could argue that it was a very natural thing for, the, for this kind of model of co collaboration, irrespective of the resource, that, um, the resource issue that was driving it. Um, can we move on to the next slide, please? So yes, this is one of the um, earliest records uh, we have of the, um, this is the County Records Committee of Westmoreland, um, um, having one of this, been a report of one of its quarterly meetings. And um, now I'm not sure what records they're referring to in this reference, because um, the Westmoreland quarter session records go back to 1658, I think. Um, but um, obviously they're talking about um, uh, a local family there, I think. Um, but it's one of the few, but this basically there was a committee set up, but um, there was no kind of tangible archive service established. Um, so can I have the next slide, please, Robert? And then we have Barrow. Now, um, when we started this talk, we were just thinking about how um, the Barrow Archives uh, Office was established in 1974, uh, beginning in Dalton and Furness, but then moving to Barrow in 1979 as a new purpose built archive centre. Um, and the first one for the service, service um, in 1979 at the back of Barrow Library. And of course, it would have been, apart from the ramp that takes you from what are now the strong rooms up to um, the library proper. Um, there would have been a there was a tiny search room, a tiny back office for um, the archive staff, um, and uh, two strong rooms. Um, it was 
kind of, uh, and then it was extended in 1998. But that is not actually the um, the comp that that wouldn't be really doing justice to the, the story of uh, the fairness area in in Cumbria. So if we could move on to the next slide, I'm going to come back to Whitehaven in a minute. Um, there are two issues really. To this is um, a chap called Reginald France um, Sharp France. Um, who was the first county archivist of Lancashire. And of course, Furness was in Lancashire. Um, um, and he was appointed um, as the first county archivist in 1940. Uh, Sorry about that. Um, it's um, so he established. So um, Furness was part of Lancashire, and of course, all the major kind of county holdings. Uh, Lancashire is was the diocesan record office of Chester. So the court of session records, including the enclosure awards and um, and other kind of key county collections, uh, would be at Preston, and they still are, of course, and they cover. Um, um, the fairness area to this day. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, this is what Lancashire Record Office looked like in 1940. I think the, the storage arrangements for the records and the ladder that's actually propped up against the records on the shelves there make for an interesting practice. Um, this is from 19, about 1946. Um, it soon became apparent that they needed to move out of um, Lancashire uh, out of their premises in the basement of County Hall in Preston and and they were concerned to do that f within about seven or eight years. Uh, they eventually did in 1960 and then if we move on to the next slide, um, 1976, uh, 1975 I should say is when the current uh, record office in Bow Lane was open and Mr France was still there. Um, 36 years later he, he retired and however um, Again, that's not the complete story. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, um, we know that uh, like a lot of record offices, um, the, um, uh, like a lot of libraries, um, particularly kind of borough libraries, um, Barrow became active in collecting records. Um, and this um, happened, the Furness collection starts in around 1947-48, and they had their own means of accessioning records. So this is an accession record of title deeds from Swarthmore Hall um, uh, near Alderston um, from around that period. So um, Cumberland, although Cumbria played a crucial role in developing uh, a purpose-built archive centre in Furness and in Barrow, it would be wrong to associate it um, to say that that's the start of archives, the archive service for the Furness area. It, it certainly isn't. Barrow Library played a crucial role and there was the county collections at Preston. Um, Whitehaven of course um, was again a very long-held dream um, of Bruce Jones in particular. So I think if we go back to the slide which has the image of both Barrow and Whitehaven on it. Um, um, obviously the police station on Scott Street is uh, where we eventually ended up um, but um, the um, Bruce Jones had in mind a primary school, a disused primary school in Whitehaven as a potential archive centre or record office for West Cumberland. We, in recognition of just the importance and the particular nature of West Cumberland as an industrial coal mining, iron ore, shipping uh, and very distinctive region of the county. Um, and, um, but again, um, although there is that side of the story, uh, Daniel Hay is an important, has, plays an important role in the history of West Cumbria, um, is um, as borough librarian at Whitehaven for, from about 1933, and he was there for an awful long time and was committed to uh, collecting records in the absence of any other provision. Um, but these archives centres were made possible with 
the creation of Cumbria Archives uh, and the creation of Cumbria County Council as a kind of um, ambition, I think, um, to have a record office within 25 miles of any community within Cumbria. And this is, of course, this is kind of pre-internet access, if you like. Um, and um, that has given us the um, the particular network of archive centres we have today. If we can move back forward, Robert, just to um, our final, my final slide, I think, or penultimate slide, um, is I think it's worth, we are coming to an important um, point in our history, but also um, in the history of uh, local government in Cumbria. And I think it's important to, I think it's, you, I think when you look at just how tenuous the, re the arrangements for record keeping were before 1962 uh, and what has been achieved since then, but particularly I think since 1974 um, with the investment that's gone into the parts of the service, um, um, you know, Cumbria has, uh, has facilitated um, um, a major expansion of the service uh, and um, it's going to be um, interesting to see how we move on from there. Um, we've got kind of three ages really of Cumbria Archive Service. So if we go to um, my final slide, um, you can see the picture of how the county has changed administratively um, since 1960 um, with the, the original counties um, and um, the Furness area separate as part of Lancashire. Um, through the period that we're just coming to the end of, um, 49 years um, of our history and a new era um, from next year. Um, and that is the story that we've we shared with the public um, of the um, service and some of its prehistory. As I say, it's really just fragments of it because I think this you, I think you know you could spend we could spend hours um, doing a symposium on the history of Cumbria Archive Service. I'm not sure how many uh, how much interest that, I know that would be of great interest to me. Um, there's so much more to, you know, to um, I think uncover in our rich history. Um, but um, but I think there are some really fascinating stories there as to how the, the service started. And I think, you know, some traditional assumptions that Cumbria was just very late, you know, one of the last counties to s establish an archive service really isn't true. Um, it's not, not a fair representation of of our story. Um, as I said at the beginning, um, there are two remarkable people I think that uh, we we wanted to share with you. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Robert now, um, who's going to um, uh, share this, the story of uh, Madeleine Elsass, who um, just used to know as a background name in the history of the service and just seeing the files of her work um, in parish surveys and other record surveys that she carried out. Um, and it's a very remarkable story. So, Robert, over to you. Thank you. I wanted to start with uh, a look at how county record officers uh, began and the national picture of archives uh, before the Second World War. And the three gentlemen I'm going to mention here I've called godfathers of local archives that's meant in a benign sense it's not some organized crime syndicate and that they, they are directly relevant to our story as well um, of Madeleine Elsass the first local authority archivist in Cumbria so the first one of these is Dr. George Fowler, who was um, actually a zoology professor at uh, University College London. Um, in the years prior to the First World War, he managed to retire in his 40s to a magnificent um, Elizabethan house in Bedfordshire. He became very passionate about the house's history and in local records in Bedfordshire. Um, he got himself elected as a county councillor in 1912, became a member of the County Records Committee. Um, Bedford County Council had already created monuments rooms in, in its county hall. And um, Fowler got to work as a sort of a, 
uh, volunteer off his uh, uh, own bat really on sorting and listing the county records. And the sort of record office opens there in 1913 and he had the services of an assistant to do the fetching and carrying. Um, that fledgling record office closed down in 1914 as uh, Fowler went off to do cartographic work for the Admiralty. And uh, he reopened that record office um, after the First World War, but um, he quickly realised that it wasn't sustainable um, doing that on his own as a retired gentleman and that he would need to train somebody up as a, a records clerk, really, as sort of a, a, a protégé professional archivist. And that brings in um, the next person um, who was uh, somebody who was mentored by Fowler, um, Frederick Emerson, who joined Bedford County Council as a sixth former, really, in 1924. Uh, he would have gone, he was destined to go on to Cambridge, but um, his father was under the impression that he'd made all sorts of uh, malinvestments and wouldn't be able to financially do that. So uh, Frederick left school and uh, went to work for the council. And uh, Emerson is sort of self-taught and taught by Fowler. Um, he sort of researches archives um, himself. And uh, Fowler, the scientist, um, is, a, is an excellent self-taught conservator. And um, so they, they've got uh, both aspects of, of the job. And um, they, they basically start um, a record office in, in the normal um, county model. You know, they, they, there's a search room where visitors uh, can come and, and look at the records. They catalogue uh, the records they have. They answer inquiries by post and telephone. Uh, they collect records from external depositors and um, not only are they looking after the county records but in the 1920s they actually start to go out and get records in from all sorts of external sources so these are manorial records from local landowners deeds poor law records uh, and church records and, and records from solicitors and landed estates and uh, fowler's uh, fowler um, publishes an important work um, in this period, in the early 1920s, The Care of County Muniments, which is the sort of the, um, the first guide for looking after uh, uh, county records. And the third person in the picture is Sir Hilary Jenkinson. Um, he's not a, a somebody who deals with county records, although he is a friend of Fowler. Um, Jenkinson spent his entire career at the public record office after graduation and um, he rises through the ranks there uh, until in 1947 he's appointed deputy keeper uh, which is effectively uh, the chief executive of the National Archives today and he publishes an important work the manual of archive administration in 1922 which is a uh, a guide to the sort of the, the records of central government. Uh, Jenkinson is a very profuse publisher on, on everything from highly technical archival subjects and such as paleography and seals, to things about the repair of documents, uh, to articles on care of archives during uh, the wartime and, and uh, post-war. Uh, and he essentially helps develop the role of um, an archivist as a new profession. Uh, with Fowler, he helped establish the British, the British Records Association in 1932 to bring together archivists, record owners and researchers and to help provide a home for records which are at risk of destruction. And as we're talking about the Second World War, he was uh, one of the monuments men, um, that is he was um, seconded to the War Office the Monuments, Fine Arts and Archives Subcommission um, of the Allied Control Commission. Uh, so Jenkinson is in uh, recently occupied Italy in 1944 um, with a team of um, army officers who were actually um, his, um, 
his former um, employees at um, the record office. And they're there to report and advise on on um, archives, uh, many of which unfortunately Italy suffered heavy damage. And then in 1945, Jenkinson and his team moved to Germany where they're doing the, um, the, the same task. So Jenkinson is um, the sort of um, colossal figure um, of the archives profession from the 1930s to uh, the 1950s. Uh, turning to matters locally, the catalyst for the appointment of an archivist seems to uh, be the death of Alan Hodgson, sorry, Alan Hodgson, who was the, um, the clerk of Cumberland County Council uh, and in office uh, at his death in March 1942. So Hodgson saw the oversaw the first evacuation of records in May 1941, uh, but it hadn't been a particularly well-run operation. Um, during those, uh, in those um, records that Peter referred to about the evacuation, we actually found a, a letter of moderate rebuke from the county architect uh, complaining that Hodgson had sent round a memo in November 1940 asking departments uh, for lists of records to be potentially evacuated, which the clerk's department would then review and select, you know, make the final selections. And in April 1941, uh, this still hadn't been done. And of course, bombs were falling, um, you know, in various parts of the county. So after Hodgson's death, um, the deputy clerk um, um, at the establishment committee makes this recommendation, a rather large chunk of text, but you can see that in going through the vast quantity of papers in the office, a large number of old documents we brought to light, many of which will probably be of considerable value and of great interest. Uh, he recommends that a records clerk be appointed and um, this is important because the deputy clerk um, Andrew Wheatley uh, went on to be appointed clerk uh, in succession to Hodgson in May 1942 and according to Madeleine Elsass Wheatley was um, very interested in and a sort of a great champion for um, archives and uh, sort of her fledgling archive service um, until he left in 1946 to be uh, become clerk of Hampshire County Council. So, just over 80 years ago, Madeleine Elsass was appointed records clerk, but in, in fact, she subsequently nearly always referred to as um, archivist or, or county archivist. I'll come back to the um, being appointed from Chelmsford later on. And we can say that there are probably three people um, that are involved in her appointment to a greater or lesser extent. The first is Sir Hilary Jenkinson directly because Wheatley had outsourced the decision on selection of an archivist from a range of candidates to Jenkinson. He asked Jenkinson if he would make this selection in London and Jenkinson agreed. So our first archivist was um, appointed by a senior figure at the Public Record Office. The next person um, in more indirectly involved is Sir William Beveridge, famous economist, director of the London School of Economics, uh, later Lord Beveridge, and of course most famous now for the Beveridge report during wartime, which helped um, lay down the, the, the guidelines for the post-war welfare state. And the third person involved perhaps needs no introduction, uh, but I will try and explain how Adolf Hitler um, and uh, the rise of Nazism uh, comes into the picture in regard to Madeleine Elsass. Uh, doing some initial research on Madeleine Elsass, um, it seemed to indicate that 
um, she was of a German Jewish family and um, this was confirmed by re uh, record cards from uh, World Jewish Relief, which was formerly the Central British Fund for German Jewry, founded in 1933. And you can see on those record cards that uh, Madeline, um, her sister Gabrielle, and her mother, uh, mother down there is Esher, but it's actually Esther, and her father Moritz, uh, occupation economist, um, are living at 29 uh, Steeles Road in Hampstead in London. And that's a, a picture of that uh, large house um, just behind the tree. It's actually the one behind the tree. Uh, and it is in an area which does seem to be um, of Northwest London, which does seem to be a sort of a Jewish area. There is a, um, a large synagogue um, nearby uh, that house. And if we look on the 1939 register, not very clear there, but in fact, um, what we see there is uh, Moritz and Esther Elsass um, living with uh, what turns out to be um, Esther's uh, mother. Um, so they were living with Moritz's in-laws, really, um, the Fernberg family. And if we just lay that out in a, in a family tree. So Madeline is born in Frankfurt, Germany, um, to a, an Anglo-German Jewish family. Her father is German, her mother is English, and they actually married in London, um, but they lived in Germany until the early 1930s. And if we just go back a generation, because this will be helpful in, in sort of establishing what happens to the family. Moritz has two sisters, um, Madeline's aunts, um, Emmy, who marries Hugo Heyman, and Martha, who marries Alfred Netter, from those later. We just look at um, Madeline's father, Moritz Elsass. Um, Hitler's rise to power um, that happened in January 1933 when he became chancellor, and a new law is quickly enacted: the Restoration of Civil Service Act in April 1933, which enabled um, the German government to uh, dismiss people uh, from academic positions or civil service positions for uh, reasons of um, a race or, or politics. And um, this caused a group of British academics, um, the initiative of um, Beveridge, the director of the London School of Economics, to find the Academic Assistance Council to help university teachers and investigators of whatever country who on grounds of religion, political opinion or race are unable to carry their work in their own country. And uh, the support of the uh, of this body, the Academic Assistance Council, was one of the reasons why the UK, after the United States, became uh, the most important host country for these exiled scholars. So Elsass is essentially a he's a he's a freelance economist. Uh, he's not tied to the university or anything in Frankfurt, but he knows. Um, these two economists at the uh, London School of Economics, Beveridge, who's the director, and Sir Arthur Bowley, who's um, who taught the LSE for more than 40 years, through bodies like the London and Cambridge Economic Service and the um, this international body on prize history. So, Elsass is one of um, 221 economists uh, from Germany and Austria who left the country in the 1930s. And he's one of 35 who came to the UK. Um, there were apparently 32 economists who didn't leave, um, Jewish economists who didn't leave Germany and Austria, and about one half of those died in the Holocaust, either in concentration camps or in Gestapo custody.
And just to highlight the threat to the Elsass family, we have this document here, the Sonde Fahndungsliste Großbritannien, um, which can be translated as the Special Search List Great Britain, or the Specially Wanted List. Um, this is, uh, it, it, it was a sort of an appendix to um, uh, a, a tourist guide, if you like, for German officers and German security services, produced for the German invasion of Britain in 1940. Thankfully, of course, it, it didn't uh, it didn't happen. Uh, but the the special search list was a list of um, about um, 2,800 uh, uh, people uh, that were to be um, uh, rounded up by the, the German security services, as well as all the organizations which they were to liquidate as well. It was drawn up by uh, the Reich Security main office under Heydrich. Uh, you'll, you'll notice these are all SS officers. And um, Schellenberg um, was the officer who claimed to have drawn up um, the, the, the search list. He claimed that in his memoirs um, after the, the war. And um, it reflects, I suppose, the uh, the prejudices of both um, Heydrich and uh, Schellenberg that um, Britain was a country run by Freemasons, Jews, and a small public school trained elite. And in fact, the same day, seventeenth uh, of September, nineteen forty, that um, Hitler postponed Operation Sea Lion, the invasion of Great Britain, um, Heydrich had actually appointed. Uh, Franz Six um, to be their man in London, um, who would form the, if you like, the squads that would um, that would round up all the people in on the search list. So he would be located in London, but there would be sort of regional task forces, if you like, in Birmingham, Liverpool, and Manchester and Edinburgh, who would hunt down these people. So there were instructions um, here about how the, the list was uh, formulated and um, how it was organized and sort of uh, says in there in, in bold letters um, um, that um, all the people on the list are to be arrested. Uh, you get a page like this uh, with the people to be arrested. And of course, who do we see on the list but uh, Morris Elsass and um, the Roman numerals, uh, it says a Reich security main officer who, who wants him. Uh, the Roman numerals indicate which office of the Reich security main office um, are to do, um, are, are interested in the individual. Uh, most are number four, which is Gestapo. In this case, Maurice Elsass was wanted by office three, um, which was spheres, uh, spheres of German life um, or, or inland security. Um, and they, uh, under Otto Ohlendorf, um, and it also dealt with ethnic Germans outside of uh, Germany's borders. Now, turning to Madeline's aunts and uncles, um, here we see the passenger list um, uh, for a ship, the Ormond, going to um, Melbourne, Australia in 1939. And we can see here um, uh, the Heymans, um, uh, Etty and Hugo were actually staying 29 Steels Road. So they, they were stopping with um, uh, the Fernbergs um, and the Elsassers uh, in London. And, and on that ship, actually, um, it was the relevant Jewish Relief Agency for Australia that had organized that. There, there are a large number of Jews escaping from Germany and Poland via London to Australia. And um, both the Heymans uh, lived out their life in uh, Victoria, Australia. So they just got out in the nick of time. Now, the other aunt and uncle, um, Martha had died in 1933 uh, and unfortunately uh, Moritz and his family had already left um, earlier that year, 
uh, Madeline left in actually in 1932. We'll come back to that. And um, that left the widowed uncle, Alfred Netter. And um, I just showed their uh, marriage entry, Alfred and Martha, um, to show that it complies with this particular decree of August 1938, by which um, all male Jews were given the um, additional name of Israel and female Jews were given uh, the additional name of Sarah. That's if, if their first name wasn't held to be sufficiently Jewish. And so th those names would go in all their official documentation so that it would become apparent, uh, even more apparent, that um, they could be identified as, as Jews. Um, so this is adding Israel to um, to Arthur's uh, name in the um, in the marriage entry. And there's another stamp. Uh, that's, that's the stamp of uh, 1939 with the, uh, the eagle and swastika. Uh, and then the additional stamp in 1949, uh, well after the war, sort of cancelling the, um, the previous stamp. And we also see confiscations by the state of um, Jews that have uh, left Germany. So here in the um, German government gazette of April, uh, nine, this one of um, April 1941, uh, we see here this entry um, mentioning the Elsass family and this particular property, uh, 116 Fargas, Frankfurt, which is essentially being confiscated by the state. Now, Alfred was the, um, the only one of the family left in Germany during the war. And uh, unfortunately, um, he was deported with a large consignment of Jews uh, from Frankfurt uh, to Theresienstadt ghetto in Czechoslovakia in August 1942. About a thousand Jews, uh, mainly from old people's homes in Frankfurt, who were on that uh, sort of overnight journey. Um, um, of those, uh, even though it was a relatively short journey, of those 11 died um, uh, on that journey, you know, it was in uh, horrible conditions in cattle trucks. And we can see from his um, uh, transport record card that he was in Theresienstadt, uh, which is in the upper left, the barracks there. Uh, from uh, 1942, um, his particular transport is given at the bottom. Um, he was number 627 on that uh, train from Frankfurt, um, uh, transport number 12 slash 1. And uh, the entry above, um, euphemism um, in Czech, um, departure to the east, which is really to the death camps. So he was um, uh, transportee number 1630 um, on a large consignment of two and a half thousand Jews from Theresienstadt to Auschwitz on the 15th of May. Uh, there were about um, seven and a half thousand inmates from Theresienstadt who uh, who had been brought there in uh, in the summer months of 1944, and. Apart from about 3,000 who were selected, um, who were thought fit enough and young enough to work, and um, the uh, the children selected by Dr. Mengele for medical experiments, um, the uh, rest of them, including Alfred, were gassed in July 1944. Just going back to Madeline, so. From her national uh, uh, naturalization file, which um, survives at the National Archives, we're able to reconstruct her education and career. And she was one of those that um, was educated. Um, she, she'd done a librarianship course at uh, University College London, and that included um, a, a a number of weeks at Bedfordshire Record Office uh, being taught conservation and archives by uh, the two gentlemen um, I, I mentioned uh, uh, 
uh, previously Fowler and Emerson. So Bedfordshire Record Office was sort of providing national training for, for archivists and conservators um, at this time during the 1930s. Uh, and uh, from uh, from there, it was a quick stay as a paleographer um, in Devizes, and then she gets taken on as um, a, a repairs assistant at uh, Somerset Record Office. And we can see uh, from the 1939 entry that um, she's down there at, at the bottom living in uh, in Taunton with um, her a profession de described as records repair um, archives. And um, she was uh, granted her uh, her naturalization uh, certificate in um, uh, 1938. Uh, uh, it, it says here it's very hard to read, but this is some of the the, the entries made on on her file. Um, it says that referees of good standing. Um, the allegation of espionage in 1936 is stated to have been made without foundation. Uh, in fact, yes, it, it, on her file there there is an allegation. Um, it was made made while she was in Somerset um, that. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> the wife of a local JP uh, obviously had some sort of grudge possibly against her for, for being German and uh, has stated that she was a spy but uh, obviously it, it was dismissed. Uh, it says they're not, not a strong case but um, it, it, it says um, uh, grant certificate uh, first to MI5 for any observations and um, the MI5 officer underneath writes back home office, uh, seen thank you, uh, we know nothing uh, to her detriment. So she gets her naturalization certificate. Now she has to leave Somerset uh, because they closed down operations during the war. And uh, she goes to, uh, she manages to secure a temporary archi archivist post at Essex Record Office in 1941. Um, Emerson had left Bedfordshire in 1938 to set up the new and larger operation at Essex. So he's the county archivist there now, and of course uh, a former mentor of, uh, of Madeline's. And she's standing in for two archivists away on war service, Hilda Grieve, who was seconded to Essex County Council on air raid precautions for the entire duration of the war. And Felix Hull, um, who uh, was actually a Quaker and conscientious objector, but um, he decided to serve in the Friends Ambulance Unit during the London Blitz. So she's there uh, until, of course, she's recruited to Cumberland in 1942, hence the mention of her being recruited from Chelmsford, where Essex Record Office is. Um, prolific activity follows at Carlisle. So we mentioned the evacuation of the records, and this is Madeline's report uh, to the County Council in October 1944. Uh, listing all the jobs that she's done, you know, evacuating the quarter sessions, other records moved to a, um, a, a sort of an extra location in Portland Square, various cupboards cleared out, listed, uh, boxed and, and sorted. And then there's this um, hugely ambitious list of uh, things to do um, that she would like to do in, in taking the service uh, forward, uh, including uh, photostatting all the uh, enclosure awards. And, you know, this is something that we have an ambition to digitise 80 years later. Same in, in terms of collecting tithe awards, because a lot of those were still out either with parish councils or with uh, church parishes and also looking to bring in estate and family records but more storage is required and also um, getting approved by the master of the roles for manorial records. Tully House of course as Peter mentioned was the only approved location for manorial records at this time. 
I uh, mentioned in the previous slide of, of records being transcribed for the 1715 and 1745 rebellions, which um, was actually published by the County Council in the 1950s, edited by Rupert Jarvis. But all the transcription work, a uh, huge amount of transcription work was done by Madeleine Elsass. Um, here she mentions wanting the record office to be a, a diocesan record office as well, so that all the church records could be brought and sorted. Uh, hence her passion for going out on a bike and doing uh, surveys of church parish records in situ. Um, and of course, being a, a trained conservator as well, uh, wanting to, um, um, you know, uh, ambitions to do further uh, repair work. Madeline stays at Carlisle until um, October 1946, when we see this mention of her, um, you know, uh, 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 during one of her outreach sessions, she did quite a few of these uh, speak, uh, talks to local groups about her work and the, the record office, uh, where she mentions that um, she was successful at interview, um, uh, beating two men and uh, Welsh speaking ones at, at that. And uh, here's one of the um, early uh, uh, sort of um, uh, publicity shots of her and articles about her uh, England organ at Cardiff um, uh, as county archivist uh, there. And um, she stays as county archivist of, of at Glamorgan uh, until her retirement in uh, 1973. And I was sent by um, uh, uh, the Morgan archives, um, a reminiscence of her by two staff uh, who joined the Glamorgan record office as junior archivist in 1963. And they say of, of Madeleine Elsass, as two newly qualified archivists, we encountered a county archivist who did not match the stereotype, male and British. Miss Elsass spoke with a pronounced foreign accent, had a distinctive dress style and will be described as a character. The embryonic Glamorgan uh, Record Office, which had been started in uh, 1939, had closed during the war and its archival resources when she took over were limited to quarter sessions records and some modern county council records. Much of her time in Glamorgan was taken up with efforts to attract deposits from major local families, industries and professional organisations. Her determination and diplomacy were extremely successful in securing major collections for the office and looking back, we appreciate just how indefatigable she was in persuading often reluctant depositors to part with their documents. Miss Elsass instilled into us and insisted upon consistency and accuracy in content and presentation. Only as our careers progressed did we fully realise the importance of this attention to detail. We remember Miss Elsass with gratitude for enforcing high standards which we tried to follow and to pass on to our younger colleagues. Looking back, we can appreciate the challenges she must have met in her early years as county archivist as a foreign woman representing a little known profession and an even lesser known institution, the Glamorgan Record Office. She was a force to be reckoned with as she persuaded officials, organisations and private individuals in Glamorgan to support their record office. She was, in a word, indomitable. And um, there's um, Obviously remembered with affection, there's a, 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 a report from the local press in Cardiff in 1976 um, of their uh, retired um, uh, county archivist. She, she retired at age 60, of course, as, as a woman in local government would have had to do at, at the time. Uh, and um, uh, she's learning to scuba dive uh, and uh, relating her holidays in Egypt and the Seychelles and, and so forth, uh, which gives a you know a nice glimpse of her character. And uh, she pops up uh, in the newsletter of the Association of Jewish Refugees uh, uh, much later in uh, 1990, giving a talk about uh, her trip to China. Now, Madeline died uh, in 1996, but one of the um, surprising uh, benefits of doing this research was discovering that um, uh, Somerset uh, Record Office um, 
had a recording made by her in 1991 in conversation with the then conservator at um, uh, Somerset, obviously reminiscing about mainly about uh, Madeline's time there in the late 1930s as, as their conservator. Uh, but in this recording, I'm going to play um, it, uh, three um, short clips uh, from this where she talks about her education and her father, uh, where she talks about um, coming to England uh, and also uh, about uh, her work um, at Cumberland. Um, and um, the sound quality isn't great, uh, particularly on the third clip. These are just about a minute or two each. Uh, but uh, when the third clip plays, she's actually, because it fades, it fades in, uh, she's actually talking about being selected by uh, Sir Hilary Jenkinson uh, to, to work at Carlisle. So uh, let's see if these play. Let, let me know if you don't hear these. I came back to England um, and they were determined that I shouldn't forget, I should keep the two languages. So I spoke English in school and English with my grandmother. But I had a governess who was actually French. No, she was Polish, but she'd taken a degree in the Sorbonne in France. She spoke through in French and German. English. So she spoke, she'd fetch me from school and spent the sort of late afternoon after school talking German to me. So I kept up the two languages. The only trouble was I mixed the languages together. So I'd sort of, um, nobody could, I spoke very fast. Nobody could understand me unless they spoke, were fluent in both languages. <laughs> <laughs> that was really me. And then, of course, I went back to Germany for school and after a year and uh, stayed there. But I used to come to England for holidays mm. and stay with mm. my grandmother all, every mm. year. Mm. So your, your, your father's family was in, uh, in Frankfurt clothing Line. manufacture? Well, no. F well, his father had been. Mm -hmm. But he, he uh, was an economist, uh, political. He took political economy. And he was an um, economist. Uh, he wrote um, a lot of books. He was... Um, was it the university member, then? Yes, no, he wasn't mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. university of Sweden. He, um, he worked with um, Professor Beveridge and Professor Bowley at the London School of Economics. In fact, they published books together. His mm -hmm. first chapter book by Professor Bowley is my, written by my father. I'd been in Geneva for a year to study French. They sent me to Geneva. This is after finishing French, school. Mm -hmm. After finishing school. And then um, in Geneva, I decided I would not live in Germany. Um, and I came to England in 32. And my parents came soon after. Um, they'd had a committee of this international history of prices in Lausanne. And uh, they went straight from Lausanne to England. To, yes, to England, and the furniture and clothes and books were sent on afterwards. My aunt packed them up and so, so this the was firm yes. afterwards. So this was before Hitler came to power? This was, mm. yes, he was just, yes, just before, yes. But you could see the way they, the way it was happening. Yes, maybe, I came in 32, they probably came just about a year later. 33 came into power. May have been just as he came into power, and they were in Lausanne and decided come straight to England. It was easy because my grandmother had a house in Hampstead and let part of the let my parents have part of the house uh, as their sort of a flat within the house. Later they had their own house. And so Hilary Jenkinson was, was to help him, mm -hmm. to help the club there to choose the candidates. Mm -hmm. So of course there were four or five candidates. And, and I was chosen, so I was very pleased that because I was really chosen by Sir Henry Jenkinson and not by. <laughs> and not by uh, anyway. Uh, what did you find up in Carlisle when you went there? Oh, Had anything been done previously? No, I was the very first one. I started from scratch, and it was in the middle of the war. Yes, it sounds But the so clerk was key keen to get the documents which were in a bad condition in cupboards all over the place mm -hmm. and in cellars, even getting damp, to have them evacuated. And put in some order and evacuated. So, so I listed them very roughly. I mean, the quarter sessions records mm. were listed. Quarter sessions rules were put in manila, manila folders, which is rather nice because they decided to have a new system of, of, um, of 
indexing current uh, of their folders. So the, all the old folders were scrapped and new ones were brought in, which were color-coded by according to the count, according to the department they belonged to. So I had all the scrapped old ones, which were good quality manila folders, I so I was able to put the yes. session's rolls flat with mm. this tape, but, uh, taped, but flattened between these manila and then boxed. And I managed to make boxes, because you couldn't buy boxes of cardboard. I mean, not in the wartime. Um, Ryder, I think, was the place where you used to get mm. boxes from, not that you probably do now. And um, we, uh, I made boxes with brass staples, brass push-through staples, um, out of manila folders. <laughs> Quite oh. a nice invention. Your repairing um, skills can, can, be, yeah. can be useful. Then. Yes, they weren't stuck together. They mm. were just stapled in some mm. way together, mm. and they weren't very strong. But mm. but they man they held and mm. we evacuated them that way, boxed them, cleaned them up, mm. and because um, they were covered with spiders oh, and nice. webs and things like that, yes. and um, anyway, that was Cumberland. They were interesting because they, well, was being the first archivist, it was always exciting finding mm. things that nobody knew was there. Yeah. They had a lot about the 1715 and the 1745 rebellion. Yes. And I, um, I wrote some book about it. Um, and was there other material, other private material coming in um, at well, all during that time? Well, we didn't really encourage them because we were mm. evacuating the places of safety, so mm. the more dispersed the documents I were, see. the better. Thank you. That concludes the presentation. Um, I'll stop recording and